Welcome to Defund the BBC. My name is Calvin Robinson, and today I'm joined by Patrick Christie's who is an award-winning freelance journalist, broadcaster, political commentator. Patrick is a regular presenter on talk radio and has appeared on Sky News as a frequent commentator. Patrick was also the youngest ever overnight editor at both The Express and The Daily Star simultaneously. What a CV. Patrick, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me, mate. Great to be here. Well, we've got so much to talk about regarding the BBC because this week alone, the BBC has confirmed it would turn BBC Four into an archive channel, whatever yeah. that is. Uh, it's announced a greater focus on young, younger appealing programmes. And the over 50s, you know, the people who pay for their licence are going to be massively under catered for as per. Do you agree, Patrick, that the shows the BBC is running round like a bunch of headless chicken, uh, not knowing what to do with its time or its money? Uh, I think so, yes. I mean, the BBC originally moved BBC Three online and kept BBC Four. Now, this is essentially, in a way, a bit of a reversal of that, the old reverse ferret, as it were, uh, in a sense that they're just kind of parking BBC Four, not really doing much with it. Uh, both of those things are, are huge decisions, and they are essentially polar opposites. So, at best, it's an admittance of a huge error, whereas at worst, I think it's a little bit like allowing Stevie Wonder to have a go on the motorway, isn't it? Um, you, you make the point there about, about the BBC not catering for older viewers, and, and I think that's fair enough. And, and I do think there are quite a few programmes, I think, on BBC One and BBC Two that older viewers may enjoy, you know, regular ones, perhaps like the Country File or, or Bargain Hunt or, or whatever, without wanting to pigeonhole too many of the older, older viewers. Uh, um, but I, I think a lot of older viewers maybe do like the softer approach perhaps of some of the BBC news output. That said, I do feel like Dan Walker is stealing a living. It's his job literally not to have an opinion. I mean, what skill does that take? When you look at Piers Morgan, you know, he's got to digest the news every day, form an opinion, not just lead the news agenda, but drag it forward. Whereas Dan Walker sits there and just says, oh, what a lovely interview that was, you know. Uh, but however, um, with all, what all of this shows, I think for me, is that, is that the Beeb is going through an epic identity crisis. I, I would argue it's not appealing to younger viewers who are more inclined to go and watch some excellent content on uh, other streaming platforms. And it's certainly not appealing en masse to the older viewers as well on, on a large scale. And this is the point for me, you know, the Beeb does have some great output, Peaky Blinders, I happen to really enjoy, but it doesn't have enough to stand on its own in a capitalist free market. And that's why I think the taxpayer should not be made to fund this. Absolutely agree with you. And sticking with the elderly for a moment, because former England cricketer and peer Lord Botham has been standing up for the elderly in Britain who have been continuously bullied and harass, harassed rather by the BBC. So Lord Botham has called it a moral crime that the BBC is demanding a license fee from the elderly. I think we'd all agree that with Lord Botham on that, and this is indeed a moral outrage and a moral crime. Do you think more people should be getting behind him to try and enact some kind of legislation protecting the elderly from these bullies? Yes, uh, 100%, uh, 100%. In terms of what should be done, yes, legislation, that would be ideal. In the meantime, a boycott might be good, and I believe actually uh, Botham did used to play with a bloke called Boycott, so you may, might know a thing or two about that, but... Uh, I, I think make the BBC send 80-year-old women to prison. Let's see how popular that is. Even Stalin would have balked at that, I think. Uh, the BBC is, is guilty of intimidation, harassment and endangering life, in my opinion. I don't use those words lightly. A lot of elderly people are poor, lonely and depressed, and that is a sad fact of British society. The BBC can provide a valuable service to some of those people simply by existing and allowing them to view it. To increase the licence fee and actively pursue those who don't pay it, like you know, going door to door like high pressure double glazing salesmen is a moral and legal outrage. They are potentially opening up a new avenue for fraudsters and con artists who can now pose as BBC bailiffs, and that's what I'm going to call them from now on, BBC bailiffs, and demand money from the elderly. Con artists, we see it already, don't we, with people. The BBC has opened the door to that, as it were. In this current climate, if you do happen to go door to door as well, what with the coronavirus crisis and everything, I would argue that that is where my endangering life element comes from. But I also think it's hypocritical. The next time that the BBC runs a segment on elderly loneliness or poor social care for the elderly, turn it off because it's weasel words. It's they're pretending to care. If your company, which spends something like four billion quid a year, can only survive if you ruthlessly pursue old people, then you haven't got a company at all. Get better content and pay your stars less. Here, here. And speaking of con men, uh, BBC bosses have admitted destroying files linked to the infamous 1995 Martin Bashir interview with Diana, Princess of Wales. 
Uh, the corporation has previously denied destroying archived documents relating to the explosive Panorama program, but has now found evidence suggesting four different dossiers have been either destroyed or not retained, whatever that means. So the BBC have faced allegations of using false documents to win over Diana's trust in order to perform the interview. Do you think this is a clear attempt of the BBC trying to cover up its tracks? Is this another example of the corporation's arrogance in trying to get away with breaking the rules? Yeah, there's, there's no way on earth that they've just accidentally deleted some of these things or that they've, you know, they've lost the files. What would be interesting for me is that presumably at some point there's been discussions on this issue over email or something like that. And at some point someone's been told, pull the trigger on this, delete, delete, delete. And if that's in writing, we should be able to FOI that. We should be able to freedom of information it because they are a taxpayer funded outlet. And therefore all of their emails and all of their interaction, in my opinion, should be made public upon request. And there's no way, shape or form that they could tell me that it would take too long for them to be able to go and do that, which is one of the, the notorious ways of knocking back an FOI is, oh, we don't want to have the resources. Just type Martin Bashir and files into anything of the BBC's inbox and it should all be there, shouldn't it? So we should be able to see that. Let's be honest, Calvin, unfortunately, it's not the first time that the BBC has been accused of a massive cover up over a massive scandal. I mean, I don't really want to, um, you know, uh, particularly name this bloke on things, but you know, there was Jimmy Savile and he was at the BBC for a number of decades. And the idea that nobody there ever knew that Jimmy Savile, arguably Britain's most predatory and horrendous paedophile, who let's be honest, hid in plain sight for a number of decades, was what he was. The idea that nobody had any idea of this and that this came as a great shock to everyone at the BBC when it was outed, only after his death, by the way, uh, is, is ridiculous. The BBC managed to sit on that. They've done a lot of terrible things over the years, frankly. I mean, the way that they treated Cliff Richard uh, for, for goodness sake, and launched, a, you know, had a helicopter outside his house uh, whilst the police raided it. And, and uh, you know, that I think the BBC needs to, needs to hold their hands up here to certain things. They do like to bracket themselves as this kind of moral bastion of goodness and otherwise dark and bleak existence. And, and the fact is, if they want to hold people to account and they want to be seen as this, this bastion of truth, then actually they need, to, they, need to, um, they need to live by their own rules here. And what went on with, with Martin Bashir was an absolute outrage that actually could, well, did really have very, very serious consequences. And yeah, this is a cover up, in my opinion, of epic proportions. And it only adds, in my opinion, to the, the diminishing of, of respect that the BBC can have. I don't really know how a lot of those people there can hold their heads up in public because there's nothing worse for me anyway than, than rank hypocrisy. And that's what this is. You know, if you're bracketing yourself as one thing, you need to be that thing. And by covering up your own mistakes, that's, that's the opposite of that. Yep, it's shameful double standards. And, you know, the BBC is now the UK's largest podcast publisher by some distance, uh, leading to accusations of significant market imbalances that hold back the independent sector. It's pretty clear the BBC has been wasting taxpayers' money in trying to compete with the private sector podcasting market. I mean, if the BBC want to compete with other podcasts on iTunes and Spotify, then they shouldn't, shouldn't they be fair about it and compete on a level playing field without our money? Yeah, the BBC gets away with stuff because it's sitting on a massive audience. That's what it is. It's sitting on an audience that has been grown over the years when, frankly, there was basically only ever one show in town. I mean, I think years ago, there really was literally only ever one show in town, wasn't there? And, and, and they're able now to do some things that they might view as very worthy or experimental or whatever, but things that actually normal people in a you know, normal capitalist competitive market could not necessarily have the freedom to do. And actually, it doesn't necessarily matter to them about results. So they can put someone forward. They can afford to do a lot of things like, you know, rampant positive discrimination or, 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 or whatever, because actually it doesn't matter to them necessarily what their viewing figures look like, because look how hard Piers Morgan, I don't want to keep harping on about Piers Morgan, but look how hard he had to work to get the bigger audience than the BBC Breakfast Show over a period of years. Dan Walker just sits there, doesn't he? Piers Morgan had to really hammer that home for absolutely ages and then eventually got it. The BBC doesn't know how lucky it is, in my opinion, when it comes to, to this stuff. They actually don't have to produce the best talent or the best output or anything like that because they know that there is just a, a ready-made audience of people there that, that frankly may maybe do not know what other options are out there. And, and that's what I find deeply frustrating. You know, it's all very well and good doing all of these things, but they have to keep coming back to this fundamental issue for me. Would this stand alone in a competitive market? What we are doing now, if it had to go toe to toe with other things that are out there, other competitive things that are out there, would it work? Would it survive? Would it command ratings? And all too often the answer is no. Absolutely. And we asked your colleague, Mike Graham, a couple of weeks ago yeah. about uh, what some of the main trends were with the angry callers phoning in and calling for the okay. license fee to be scrapped. What would you say is the one thing your audience repeatedly gets triggered by when talking about the BBC? 
Well, it's left wing bias is is uh, is un undeniable. The, you know, the, the absolute outrageous left wing bias, even in Call the Midwife, believe it or not. I only watched one episode of Call the Midwife and it was on Christmas Day and I was so full of turkey and cranberry and Christmas pudding that I couldn't reach over to the remote and lob it at the telly. But they even made a subtle anti-Brexit joke in Call the Midwife on Christmas Day. I mean, for goodness sake, you know, all of this stuff. And actually, the subtle indoctrination of children as well. And I'll come out and just say this. The way that the BBC presents its news and the way that the BBC even presents news on things like Radio 1, which has got a disproportionately youthful audience, the way that they present those things is always done with a left-wing slant. Uh, and for me, this is absolutely outrageous. I was even watching uh, something last night. It was on, on BBC News, which was about the, um, uh, the, 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 the racial issues in this country and the fact that is Britain institutionally racist, you know. And the way that they attacked that story was outrageous. They went in with an angle on it. They would read the report and then, you know, they started interviewing a load of people. And basically the upshot of it was, and this is what really, really wound me up. The upshot of it was that basically all the people who they had on there who were ethnic minorities who were saying that they think Britain is institutionally racist. The angle that they were going for was that they didn't like that particular black man who'd helped write that report because they didn't agree with him. Now, I think that's pretty racist, to be perfectly honest with you. If you don't have the same views as that particular individual, then that person must be, and this is their favourite word, some kind of gatekeeper or something like this. Now, I find that absolutely disgusting. It made my toes curl when I watched it. But that is going out to a lot of people who maybe don't think as critically as someone like you and I might do about the news. Maybe people who, who aren't really into news, they've got other jobs or they are, as I've said, children who just watch this and digest this stuff and let it wash over them. And they don't realise that soft indoctrination that's happening uh, there. And that for me is, is, is the biggest issue that I get on the phone lines on, on talk radio, which is people just accusing them of, of, of this left wing bias. The BBC, by the way, I had a, a friend of mine who works at BBC, well, I won't say exactly where he works actually in the BBC, just in case, but he works there. And uh, he says that he does a radio show and uh, he's one of the good guys. And he says that um, when he does, a, he does a show, they call him into a room normally afterwards and they say, can you just explain to us exactly why you got this guest on to talk about this topic and why you didn't go for somebody who was perhaps of an ethnic minority or a woman or whatever. And one time he was interviewing a famous footballer who had had an affair and he was interviewing them about that affair. And the BBC called him into a room afterwards and said, why did you go for that person and not someone who was, and he went, this is the bloke who's had the affair. This is the news. What do you want me to do? I can't just interview somebody else. And this is where we're at. They're so focused on unconscious bias that they can't see their own unconscious bias when it comes to a whole host of things. And that's the biggest issue for me. And I believe anyway, a lot of talk radio listeners. Patrick, thank you very much for speaking up and thank you for fighting the good fight on talk radio, the home of common sense. Good to see you. <laughs>